Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. As many of you know, Pam and I just returned from a short-term missions trip to Chile. We got home yesterday morning. It was an amazing trip. We joined a team from our previous ministry in Nevada. We ministered during the day, teaching a seminar to leaders about Rooted, our discipleship program that we're experiencing here. Every night we were in services. It was uh, an amazing, amazing experience. I like to say on these trips, I live a month in seven days, uh, and uh, we got home yesterday. Tank was pretty empty, but I'm feeling really, really uh, excited today to be able to minister in this new series that we're starting today. Uh, Pam and I first arrived in Chile in May of 1998, uh, 40 years ago just about, and uh, our oldest daughter Rachel was just a couple of years old, our second daughter Christina was a matter of months old, and our two other children that were born in Chile had not, had not uh, been born yet. We didn't know exactly what we were going to be doing. We weren't joining an organization per se. Uh, there was a, a, a group that we were joining, but not really an organization with a clear assignment. But we were confident that God had called us to the nation. We knew that he was going to show us what to do. Uh, we settled in a town called Kilpoe. Kilpoe is a coastal town right close to Viña del Mar. And uh, we didn't have any missionary families uh, that we were working directly with, but there was a group of missionaries that we were associated with that were in Santiago, two hours away. And so, in order to have fellowship with other North Americans, every other week, twice a month, I would drive to Santiago, the two hours, to uh, have fellowship with these friends that uh, became our, sort of our lifeline. By and by, I discovered that uh, many years earlier, they had uh, created a Bible correspondence course, and in fact, they had established a, a huge literature ministry. They, they uh, built a, or purchased pr a printing presses, and uh, in the course of months of conversations, I eventually found out that uh, they had a warehouse with hundreds of thousands of Bible studies and teaching materials that uh, was there. It had been produced and paid for by a missionary that had long since returned to the United States, and nobody in that group was using any of that material. And so one day I asked, uh, well, would you mind if I start using that material? And they said, why, sure, it's just sitting in this warehouse. So for five years, every time I would go to Santiago, I would take my VW van, didn't I? I took out all the seats, left them back at home, and I would fill my VW van with hundreds of thousands of Bible studies and Sunday school materials and things, and we had these materials, and so I opened up an office in Kilpoe where I lived and uh, hired a Chilean brother to manage the office, and we began distributing for free to Hundreds of churches in our area, tens of thousands of Christians received these materials for free because they were sitting in a warehouse, nobody was using them, and I said, well, let's start using them. Now, that's an example of, a, of God working upstream. When I got to Chile, I had no idea that those materials were there, that somebody had printed them, stored them, paid for them, and they were sitting there. And it opened up a door of ministry that really was phenomenal. It gave us contacts with lots and lots of churches and church leaders, and that led to many other things that opened the door for us for our ministry in Chile. So I had no idea that any of that existed previously, and it's exactly what Ephesians 2.10 teaches us. I learned it by experience. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God was working upstream long before my family got to Chile, preparing good works for me to do, for us to do. Another example happened when we arrived in Nevada to plant a new church. A year before we arrived in Nevada, a family from my home church in Southern California had moved to Northern Nevada to another city to plant another church. 
When they found out, when my home church found out that we were moving to northern Nevada to plant a new church, they put us in contact with this other family that had moved to another area to plant a new church. That family then, or that contact, introduced us to a man named Don Nelson. Don Nelson was a part of the first Bible study with six people in my living room that eventually became some of the church of 2,300 people. Don Nelson, don't lose me in this, introduced me to Steve Denny, who became our first worship pastor. This is the point. God was working upstream long before we got to northern Nevada. God was preparing ministry people for us to connect with. God worked upstream in beautiful ways. Steve Denny, our first worship pastor, is what I call a 10-talent guy. He was an all-star quarterback for the local high school, straight-A student. He was uh, preparing to go to medical school at the time, a very bright young man. And he also played the guitar and was a worship leader. And so one day, I sat down with Steve at a restaurant. And I said, Steve, I want you to consider giving up your small plans of being a doctor and come and be our worship leader. And oh, by the way, because we were only about 120 people at the time, we can't pay you anything, but if you serve for this next year and are faithful, I think the church could grow to a place where in about a year we might be able to pay for you to, 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 to serve as our worship pastor. Lo and behold, he gave up his small dreams of medicine and continued to work construction for the whole next year, became our worship pastor, and uh, God was working upstream. But not only did Steve serve as our worship pastor, turns out that his parents, Bill and Theda Denny, were amazingly well-networked in the community, strong believers. And Bill and Theda Denny, his parents, served in the church in all kinds of ways. And not only did Steve bring his parents, but another couple, Joan and Byron, and Byron, for about 20 years of the life of the church, uh, was the most generous giver in the church. He started a children's program called Awana. The Awana program at the church became one of the largest in all of the West Coast. His wife, uh, Joan, was active in worship ministry. Not only did Steve bring those two couples, he also brought his brother, who was our main sound tech for the next you know, several years. And he also brought his younger brother, uh, who we affectionately call Bones, Ryan, who was our bass player, only bass player for a number of years, who eventually became my son-in-law. So God working upstream long before we ever got to Nevada had these people in place for us when we arrived there. So all of this to say, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is incredibly important for every one of us in this room to grasp. God is preparing in advance a work for you to do. Right now, God is pre preparing something meaningful, God-honoring for you to do that will advance His purposes. Now, I've shared two examples, one from when we went to Chile, one when we moved to Nevada. I could cite other examples. I think that was clearly at play here. When, when before we got here, uh, Lucho was, was waiting in the wings. Priscilla was here. And, and uh, God, uh, before we got here, God was setting the stage. And then Harrison and Jose walked through the doors. And it's just been beautiful to see how God worked ahead of time preparing for the work that he's doing here. I'm not an exception. This scripture applies to every one of us. When we accept Christ, when we're born again, God begins to work in our lives and prepares things for us to do that will honor Him and bless Him. And one of those things that he's preparing for us is someone that we can share Christ with. Someone that we can present to G Jesus to. You are prepare, you're, God is preparing someone in your sphere of influence for you to show Jesus to in a way that no one else can. Because no one else has your experiences. No one else has your background. No one else has your, your worldview. And so... 
He is preparing you, but he's preparing someone in your sphere of influence for you to show Jesus to. This is the first week in our series, Ripples. In the next three weeks, we're going to consider one of the most powerful and important chapters in the Bible, though you might have never studied it like we're going to study over these next three three weeks. It's Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 tells the story of Cornelius, a Gentile, a non-Jew, and how he comes to know Jesus. And as we look at this story, we're going to see some very important things about how he prepares us to share Christ. He prepares people for us to share Christ with and all uh, how that impacts the cause of Christ. And so I hope that uh, you, you'll stay with us over these next three weeks because this, this chapter, that you've never, perhaps never studied it at length, I think at the end you're going to say, wow, this is a gold mine for us to be looking at. God wants us to make ripples in our lives. That's what we're calling this in the world. He wants us to make ripples. He wants us to have an impact. He wants you to make ripples in the lives of people around you. One of my favorite all-time places to go backpacking is in the Grouse Ridge Recreation Area in Northern California. A few years ago, I was there, and I camped right next to uh, Penner Lake, one of the many lakes in that area when you go backpacking. It may have been the most beautiful campsite that I've ever been at, and I've been at some beautiful places. And I remember waking up in the morning, and when you wake up when you're backpacking, it's just so beautiful. It's calm, it's crisp, it's, it's glorious. And the lake was like a mirror, just a mirror. You could see the reflection of the mountains and the sky, pristine absolutely beautiful, just like a mirror, that lake. And every once in a while, a fish would jump. And there would be this ripple. Ripples, ripples, ripples. And then it'd be calm again, breathtaking. And then another fish would jump. Ripples, ripples, ripples. Ripples are what God wants us to have in the world around us. That we would ripple, that we would in some way change the status quo of the world around us. And uh, I I believe that that's what God is calling us to in the text. So I'm going to read from Acts chapter 10, the first several verses. You can follow along on on the screen or in your notes. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him in fear. I would stare at fear too if an angel called me by my name, Steve! What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. I've been to that house. When the angel who spoke to him had, had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joshua. Uh, to Joppa. A Caesarea is located about uh, 40 miles north of Joppa. I've been there several times. Uh, uh, Caesarea was a beautiful port that had been built by the Romans to give them access to the area known as Palestine. The traditional port, Joppa, south, was a Jewish port, and the Jews hated the Romans. So they made it very difficult for the Romans to use that port, and because of that, the Romans built this other port in Caesarea. Now, Joppa is a name that might sound familiar to some of us. Ring a bell. This is where uh, Jonah uh, fled from God's call. Same port, same place. He fled uh, from the call to Nineveh. So there was a man in Caesarea. His name was Cornelius. 
I want you to notice in the text today how God was preparing Cornelius to hear about Jesus. God was working upstream in Cornelius' life so that he would be ready to hear about Jesus. And in the same way, God is preparing somebody for you and me to share Jesus with. God is working upstream. You may have never thought about this until this morning, but God is working upstream. There are people that He is positioning in your life that uniquely you and you alone can present Jesus in a way that that person can hear. God is working upstream in the hearts and minds of people all around us. Now, as we see an example how God was working in Cornelius, in verse 2 it says, He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. So before Peter eventually pre presents the gospel, Cornelius is already being attracted to something about God. When it says that he was God-fearing, in the book of Acts, seven different times, the word God-fearer God -fearer is used, God-fearing. It was code, it was a language for, Jew, or for, for uh, Gentiles who had embraced the God, Yahweh, the God of the Jews. So the Romans had a pantheon of gods. They worshipped hundreds and hundreds of gods. Cornelius had tired of that, and he had become a God-fearer, which meant he was taking steps, opening himself up to eventually hear the gospel. So we see here God working ahead of time in Cornelius' life. Uh, he, is, as we'll read in the passage eventually, he eventually becomes the, the first Gentile to become a believer, at least first Gentile recorded in Scripture. Another example of how God was at work in his life, the text says, he gave generously to those in need. So that tells us that he was sensitive to the needs of the people around him. It also shows us that God's Spirit was at, at work within him. Normally, it takes time till a person begins to live generously for the cause of Christ. Someone once said that people need to experience three uh, conversions. A conversion of their head, a conversion of their heart, and then a conversion of their pocketbook. And we're believing in revival here in ECF in our pocketbooks, okay? The fact that Cornelius gave gen generously uh, tells us that, that God was seriously at work in his life. Because he was releasing his resources to help the poor. So I want us to see that God was at work in Cornelius' life long before Peter shows up later in, the gospel, or later in this chapter to present the gospel. And it's exactly the same for us, friends. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works with God prepared in advance. He's at work in advance of you preparing people for you to present the gospel to. There's someone in your life who's being prepared to hear about Jesus in a way only you can present. They're just waiting for you to say something or for you to reflect something or for you to, in some way, uh, give demonstration to the gospel of Christ. Now, one of the chief ways that God prepares people is by allowing them to go through difficulties. I love the quote from C.S. Lewis, pain is God's megaphone to get our attention. God uses pain to remind us we need Him. Now, when everything's going thumbs up, basically people often forget about God. You know, when your job is going well, when your family is going well, when your health is going well, many people don't really think about God because after all, my job is going well, my family is going well, my health is going well. Why do we need God? But take any one of those away and there's moments of pain and people begin to realize, whoa, they're, God, I need your help. I need your help. So if you want to look for someone who may be open to hearing about Jesus, I want to encourage you, begin looking for people who are going through difficulties. And you don't have to look very far because they're all around us. There are people in your sphere of influence, friends, that might be open to hearing about Jesus. Many of them may be going through very difficult times. So... There's never been a time, I don't think, for you to share more positively the message of Jesus than to bring that message to somebody in need around you. Moving. Moving is also another uh, season when people are often open to hearing about the gospel. Studies, many studies have been done that when people relocate, uh, they tend to be more open to the gospel. Why? Well, because their routines are different. Their job is different. Their family and friends, their circles are all different. 
And because there's all these differences, oftentimes people are open to hearing the gospel. And you don't have to look very far in Costa Rica to find somebody that's relocating or moving or changing. So begin opening your eyes to people that might be open to the gospel because they've moved. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, what God prepared in advance for us to do. This means God's working upstream. God is at work preparing good works for us to do. One of those good works includes preparing people for you to point to Jesus. So begin looking at the people that you know that are going through difficulties. Looking for opportunities. You don't smash their head with a Bible, friends. You just winsomely, lovingly, kindly present the grace of Jesus. There are people you know that God is preparing to hear about Jesus. Now, sometimes we recognize these people because they're going through difficulties. Sometimes we recognize these people because they have been moving. But if we just keep walking and keep moving at a normal pace, oftentimes we'll miss seeing these opportunities. And that's where I find myself many times. You know, I have my agenda. I have my list of to-dos. And I go boom, 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 boom. I got to get my to-dos done. And I can walk right past people who God may be bringing to me to hear a fresh word of grace, a fresh word of kindness. So I need to pause and keep my eyes open like you do. Keep your eyes open. God is preparing someone for you to share Jesus with. Let me share just one example of many I could give. A while back, I was in conversation with somebody I just met. And it was the most natural, beautiful conversation because my eyes were open, my heart was open. He began telling me about some difficulties that he was having. And it was the most natural and beautiful moment for me to invite him to church Invite him to draw closer to Jesus. It wasn't weird. I didn't pull out a tract and, you know, tell him about, you know, this or that. It was just a natural, beautiful conversation. So the question is, who is your Cornelius? Who is your Cornelius? Who is God preparing in your sphere of influence, in your circle of friends, in your circle of acquaintances, that might be someone God wants you to present the message of Jesus to or simply invite them to church? Who is God preparing for you to share Christ with? Who is your sphere of influence? Could you invite to church? Now, this is very, very important to me because I was once Cornelius. I didn't grow up in a faith-based home. And I was once Cornelius. I was searching, but I didn't know what I was searching for. Maybe just like Cornelius. And my life has been forever changed because a young man by the name of Ron had the courage, seized the opportunity, and told me about Jesus. I met Ron when I was a junior in college. We were roommates. Ron didn't know it when I moved in with him, but I had come through two years of very, very difficult times. When I graduated from high school, I was voted most likely to succeed. I was going to conquer the world. And so when I entered as a freshman at University of Notre Dame, I thought I was ready to conquer the world. But I fell flat on my face. Very difficult semester, transferred back to UCLA, got lost in a sea of 50,000 other students, it was the loneliest, most difficult season in my life. I was floundering. And so I decided against the wishes of my parents to forego a very, very lucrative ROTC scholarship that had paid everything for my first two years in university at very expensive universities. And I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, a state university, not a big-name school at all. And that's where I met Ron. We were classmates, and then we moved in together. Ron didn't know it. My heart was empty, I was hurting, I, was, I didn't have friends. 
And I saw Ron, and he had friends. And they were cool friends. They were fun friends. They were interested in more than just getting drunk on the weekends. They had purpose and meaning in their lives. And I lived with Ron, and I was attracted to his life as a vibrant Jesus follower. I'd never come close to anybody who loved Jesus before. I didn't want anything to do with those people. But now I'm living with Ron. And by and by, I asked Ron what made his life different. And he told me about Jesus. And there came a time when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And now, 47 years later, my life is totally, radically, permanently different. And my eternity is secure because I'm with Jesus. So when I talk about Cornelius being prepared, I resonate with this. I was being prepared through pain, through loneliness, through emptiness. But I've asked myself occasionally over the years, what would have happened if Ron had not mentioned Jesus? What would have happened? I mean, if he could have said... Well, I don't want to, you know, upset the apple cart. After all, Steve's the only roommate I've ever had that actually cleans the kitchen and cleans the floors and leaves the house clean. You know, he's a pretty good guy to live with, even though he's not a believer. Uh, if I talk to him about Jesus, maybe he'll cut and run. He didn't say that. When the time was right, he shared with me about Jesus. And I was right. I was prepared. So this story about Cornelius is very, very personal to me. And it causes me to ask you again, what would happen if you begin to open your eyes? What would happen if you begin to look for people that are hurting, people that are moving, or just people in your sphere of influence that might be open to hearing a winsome word about Jesus? You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for you to do. He's prepared in advance for you to do something. God is working upstream. He is preparing someone, someone for you to share about Jesus. That uniquely, you and you alone can present that message in the package of your life because your life is unique. No one else's. Will you stop and notice them? Will you say something? Will you invite them to church? Or will you just keep walking on by, doing your to-dos, and overlooking the opportunities that God may be bringing to you, friends? Speaking as someone who was once Cornelius, I beg you, I plead with you, would you open your eyes? And when the time is right, would you share about Jesus? Would you point them to Jesus? Or would you at least invite them to church? you know what, I don't have all the answers, but I'm discovering a place that will love you well and will point you in the right direction. And friends, if we do that as a church family, the sky's the limit of where this church is going to go, and it's going to be amazing.